This section would have been impossible to make without Randy Engel's 1,300-page expose of the homosexual colonization of the Catholic Church. Paul VI was born Giovanni Battista Montini in 1897. His parents were well-to-do leftists. His father was editor of a Catholic newspaper. His mother was of noble birth and a political activist. He had a sheltered childhood due to frequent bouts of illness. He is described as being a shy and melancholic boy. He was first enrolled at a traditional Jesuit school, but at the age of 14 was removed to be tutored at home. He entered the seminary at the age of 19. Because of the war, he did not experience the normal vigors of seminary life. He received one dispensation to live at home and another dispensation from wearing a cassock. While in the seminary, he read books by Oscar Wilde at a time when the artist's works were difficult to obtain, and the artist himself was heavily associated in the public mind with sodomy. After being ordained, his parents pulled some strings to get him out of a parish assignment and into the diplomatic service in Rome. As a result, he never spent so much as a day as a parish priest before becoming pope. In Rome, he was despised openly by many of the old guard, but was also protected by certain influential individuals. He had little or no spiritual life, and a particular aversion to the rosary. At this point, we will digress to tell two other stories that coincide with Paul VI's rise to the papacy. A bright young Catholic woman named Bella Dodd was recruited into the Communist Party USA in New York in the 1920s. She obtained her law degree and eventually became head of the New York State Teachers Union, as well as a high-ranking official within the Communist Party. In 1949, after 21 years as a member, she was expelled from the party. A few years later, she met with Bishop Fulton J. Sheen and was received back into the Catholic Church. Shortly after her return to the church, she testified before the United States Senate, detailing the communist infiltration of labor unions and educational institutions. She also claims that in the 1930s, that the party put 1,100 men, men without faith and without morals, into the priesthood in order to destroy the church from within. The idea was for these men to be ordained and then climb the ladder of influence and authority as monsignors and bishops. Even more shocking, she claimed that when she was an active party member, she dealt with no fewer than four cardinals that were working for the communists. She emphasized that the communists knew that the only power that could destroy them was the Catholic Church, and they were determined to undermine it. It's also known that the Soviets were experts on how to recruit, blackmail, and control sexual deviants and use them for subversion. They kept a large stable of highly trained homosexual agents, whose very targets included foreign diplomats. It has been reported by communist defectors that in the early 1930s, Soviet ambassador to England, Ivan Maisky, proposed a plan to Joseph Stalin to recruit upper-class Englishmen before they entered the corridors of power. They began recruiting members from England's two most elite universities, Cambridge and Oxford. The plan turned out to be an enormous success. The Soviet's A-team became known as the Cambridge Five, Anthony Blunt, Guy Burgess, Don McLean, and Kim Philby, while the fifth man's identity is disputed. All were sodomites who operated in elite homosexual circles in London. The first man, Anthony Blunt's closest confidant and lover, Peter Montgomery, and his brother Hugh Montgomery, were also members of this elite homosexual clique. Hugh Montgomery, according to another member of the homosexual circuit, while a young diplomat working under the British representative to the Vatican, claimed to have been lovers with a certain Monsignor Montini. Montgomery later converted to Catholicism and was ordained a priest. This raises the question of whether Montini was being blackmailed by the Soviets which leads us to a former member of the Vatican Noble Guard, Franco Bellagrande. 
In his book, Nikita Roncalli, he writes that while Montini was Secretary of State, he was found out to be providing names to the Soviets of priests operating behind the Iron Curtain. According to Belagrande, Pius XII launched a secret investigation and a collection of papers was found, attributed to Montini, that signaled to the KGB the names and the movements of the priests who in those years exercised covertly their ministry amongst the oppressed populations of the communist countries. As the priests crossed over the Russian border, the Soviet secret police were on hand, and the priests were either shot or sent to the gulag. Upon reading the papers, Pius XII collapsed and remained in bed for many days. He immediately removed Montini as Secretary of State and assigned him as Archbishop of Milan. In Milan, the allegations of sodomy would continue. There are several reports that the local police picked up Montini dressed in street clothes for soliciting a male prostitute. In 1976, a well-known homosexual activist publicly accused Montini of having an affair with a young man named Paul while he was Archbishop of Milan. The accusations were published in prominent Italian newspapers. Members of Vatican security also claimed that while Montini was Pope, his friend Paul, an actor, had free access to the pontifical apartments and was seen taking the elevator at night. In 1984, New York Times press correspondent Paul Hoffman gives the name of Paul VI actor boyfriend. His name was Paul Carlini and can be seen here cutting Audrey Hepburn's hair in the film Roman Holiday. One cannot help but contemplate in horror whether Paul VI chose his papal name in honor of his homosexual lover, Paul. Allegations emerged again in 1993 when John Paul II tried to canonize Paul VI. The Abbe de Nantes addressed him. So, after the scandal of the election of an avowed homosexual to the throne of St. Peter, having poisoned the church, you, Most Holy Father, would have him relive and gain strength by having this same wretch of a Paul VI raised to the altars, and his bones offered as relics to the faithful for their pious kisses, and his tormented face presented to their fervent gaze in Bernini's Gloria. Ah, no, that is impossible. It will not be. Montini also moved his fellow sodomites into key positions in the church while at the same time he gutted the curia of traditional clergy by instituting a mandatory retirement. And what was the result when word went out across underground homosexual networks that one of their own had been placed on the papal throne? They entered the seminaries in droves, to the point where today, masculine men with genuine vocations are selectively weeded out via psychological profiling, or forced to remain in the closet for fear of offending their homosexual superiors. If anyone doubts this, I suggest getting hold of the book, Goodbye Good Men, How the Catholic Church Turned Away Two Generations of Vocations from the Priesthood, by Michael S. Rose.